I'm Leslie Desaulnier, and right now I live in a little town called Woodacre in Northern California. And before that, I lived in New York City for many, many years. Through a series of circumstances, when I was about 20 years old, uh, I landed myself at an ashram in upstate New York, where I had intended to only stay for a night, but I met a spiritual teacher who was uh, really, really wild and beautiful and kind of outrageous, and she blew my mind. So I um, stayed with her for the weekend, and I decided that I would like to drop everything in my life and sell everything that I own and uh, go move and live with her so I could learn about yoga. So that's what I did. And <laughs> I lived at an ashram in upstate New York for a couple of years. And um, this beautiful woman took me under her wing and taught me a lot about Sanskrit and meditation and the fire ceremonies twice a day. And of course, I learned a lot about yoga. So I feel very blessed that I had the karma in this lifetime to meet um, this person and, and to be under this lineage. And that's, that's my story. When I was living at this ashram, I um, started to get more involved with Jivamukti Yoga and the brilliant teachers Sharon Gannon and David Life. So they are also devotees of the same guru from this ashram named Sri Brahmananda Saraswati. So um, I had practiced at Jivamukti for many years before living at the ashram, but then when I lived there, uh, I decided I was going to train with Sharon and David. So they've been incredibly influential to me in my life. And, uh, and again, I just feel really blessed that I could learn under them for so many years. And I'm still inspired by their teaching and their lives. The first thing that comes to my head in terms of a memorable moment, something that's happened over the years, was after the birth of my first daughter, I didn't know what to expect. So I didn't know how I would respond. So many people were telling me what the experience of being a yogini, having a very serious practice, having a spiritual, having a sadhana, um, and being a mother. And I had so, many, so much feedback from people, kind of conflicting. So I didn't really know where I was going to fall. So I think mystical and surprising occurrence was that everything was pretty easy <laughs> to come back into. And that having children has actually helped me to become more regular in my practice, has deepened my um, connection to my spiritual practice, to my sadhana, and uh, it only makes the experience uh, richer and deeper for me. So that's kind of my mystical experience. How has yoga prepared me for giving birth and being a mother? Um, you know, well, we're never prepared, <laughs> but I think that... Um, I think that the energy of motherhood is a creative energy, so I think it applies to anything that I've ever created in my life. Uh, I think that yoga gives you the steadiness to be present with another being. And I know that, um, you know, I tend to do my practice before my girls wake up in the morning. And on days that I miss my practice, I definitely feel like a different level of presence. So for me, the greatest thing that I can do for my family and for my kids is to uh, stay connected to my practice and sit in my meditation and do my asana practice. And uh, it prepares me because I can listen better. I'm more receptive and less attached to uh, little things. It gives me a broader perspective. And I think that that is something that has followed me through 20 years of practicing and teaching, is that it continues to open my eyes and uh, chill me out which is important. In the spiritual path, it doesn't only go in one direction. It doesn't go like this. It would be nice if it did, but it goes in waves. And it's a roller coaster, and it goes up and down. It can go all over the place. So um, having consistency of your practice can give you a home base to return to when uh, difficulty arises. But at different points in our lives, we're going to feel some setbacks, we're going to feel heartbreak, we're going to lose our job, something is going to happen that will throw us off. So there are different ways that we can deal with these um, 
disturbances. And even in uh, the context of a yoga practice or a meditation practice, sometimes hindrances will emerge, right? like uh, boredom or fear or judgment, depression, insomnia. Should I go on or do we understand <laughs> this, this category of things? So say, for instance, fear or something arises in the practice. Um, I was on a seven-day meditation retreat a couple months ago, which was a silent retreat. And it's pretty intense because you meditate from 5.30 in the morning until 9.30 at night, alternating half an hour, 45-minute sitting and walking meditation. So you basically go through like every relationship you've ever had in your life, and every emotional experience possible during this time. And you leave, believe it or not, like in heaven. But you have to go through it to get there, right? So anyways, during this, one of the teachers was speaking of uh, hindrances that arise when you're doing this kind of spiritual practice. And this applies to the asana practice as well. So she was mentioning it's kind of like a four-step system. So say that you have fear arise in your consciousness. Um, the first thing you can do to try to get rid of it uh, or to try to work with it, maybe rather than get rid of it, to work with it is naming it. Right. So if you're doing a practice and you notice that fear is arising, sometimes just naming it can um, start to dissipate its grip on you a little bit. You can see something. You know, there is a uh, very fundamental yogic teaching that if you can name something or you can witness something, then you know you are not that thing. So that practice of naming it just gives you a little sense of separation, a little sense of distance from it, so then it becomes workable. And sometimes that works. Sometimes you go, ha, ah, fear, here you are again, <laughs> welcome back. And you're going to see it, and you work with it, and then sometimes it kind of goes away. Sometimes that doesn't work. So the second step, if naming it doesn't work, is to have some compassion for yourself. So it can be really difficult to experience fear. And sometimes what can happen is when, especially on the spiritual path, if we experience something like fear, we can start to layer on top of it, oh my God, I'm afraid again, and when will I ever learn, and I'm never going to be free from this, and I shouldn't be doing yoga, and how dare I say I'm a yoga teacher, and blah, 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 and it goes in whirls. And um, the, I think the Buddhist word for that is, is papancha, which means like um, proliferation, like popcorn. Things keep popping up and layering. I have a very beautiful meditation teacher named Sharon Salzberg, and she calls that experience pain plus. Which I like. It's like adding a horrible self image onto an already uncomfortable experience. So, when that happens, rather than kind of going into that other space with your head, can you allow yourself just to have some compassion? Mm. Yeah, hold yourself in that. It's hard to feel fear, right? Rather than vilifying the experience of yourself, have some compassion. And sometimes dropping into that helps it move a little bit. And sometimes that doesn't work. So the third step would be um, have, applying mindfulness. So applying mindfulness to the experience. Like where is it living exactly in your body? So fear might grip your stomach. And you might feel, OK, well, there's tension in my stomach. Or I'm having a hard time breathing. So maybe that's what you start to address. Kind of get into it on that level. And get your body in check. Or start to mindfully check out where your consciousness is moving, right? where that experience is living in your body. And sometimes that can release it. Like if you're having a hard time breathing, lost your breath, applying mindfulness to that will bring your breath back, and that can start to break up the experience of that emotion a little bit. So maybe that doesn't work. So you've got three steps. And then the fourth step is, well, then you have to sit with it. right? Recognizing that it's there because it needs to teach you something. And that eventually, but inevitably, it will move. Because all conditioned states are impermanent. Right? So it might not move on our timetable. might not move according to uh, what we have scheduled on our iPhone. Right? But it will move. And sometimes we have to sit with something because it's meant to be there at that moment. Sadhana is a conscious spiritual practice. And Sangha is your community. So, or Satsang could be your community. Um, so, you know, many yogis say that in these times, 
that satsang or having a spiritual community is one of the most important practices. And I've certainly found that in my life. There was a great teacher uh, who used to come to my studio in Brooklyn very often, Sham Das, who I loved. And he passed away a couple years ago. And he used to say, it's all about who you hang out with. And this is true, that uh, if we hang out with a conscious community of spiritual friends, people who encourage us on the path, that are doing work on themselves, uh, it helps to inform our own sadhana. It helps to deepen our own spiritual practice. With yoga getting so big now, um, where does yoga go from here? I think the answer I have is yoga will be fine. <laughs> it always has been, right? And, um, Yoga will be fine. It is fine. How do you know your practice is working? Uh, are you happy? And how are you treating others? Those kind of things. Uh, that always indicates to me, like if I'm particularly reactionary with my husband or feeling like I'm not focused, it means that I might have to shift a little something in my practice, maybe deepen it a bit, sit for 10 minutes longer in meditation, whatever it is. But the, for me, the compass is always, are you happy? <laughs>